You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we'll examine Joanna Lumley's lost roles in Fab Facts. We are trapped in the depths in the randomizer. And we're heading into a ghost mine with three free chapters of the latest Gemini Force One audiobook. That's all coming up in Pod 121 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Now, have you got oh. your breath? <laughs> have you got your breath, Jamie? Yes. Are you doing this to dob me in? <laughs> yes. Definitely. Okay, so immediately before recording, I had to run next door uh, oh. up the lane to go and retrieve my deaf old dog, Ernie, who breaks through the fence and then gets oh. into their garden and just stands there randomly barking and then runs up onto the lane. And uh, so That's true. Yes. Anyway, Bless. this is not the uh, Jamie Runs and Gets a Dog podcast. This is no. the Jerry Anderson podcast, where we talk things all Jerry Anderson for about 90 minutes and have yes. very many features relating to the titular subject of the podcast. That's very true. Yes, I'm Richard James, and he's uh, Jamie Anderson. And just over there, we have Chris Dale, who will be joining us a little later on for his amazing randomizer, whereby he sits down in front of a random Jerry Anderson story and gives us his thoughts and comments. Also coming up, we've got some news and news, news, news from the Jerry Anderson universe. We've got a fab fact or two to delight your ears. And even more delightful, we've got some messages from our very own podstrons who've been emailing us in their droves to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. They've also been uh, tweeting us and hashtagging us, Jerry anderson podcast and they've been taking part in our facebook group as well facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons i've never said quite so many words in one go before how did i do (laughs) yeah you did extremely well well done (laughs) also oh did i miss something well no 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 it's not not from this i mean there's a lot of Jerry Anson stuff happening right now, and there's a lot of yeah. free Jerry Anson stuff happening right now because yes. normally we'd have an interview. But this week we've got three chapters from Ghost Mind for you, uh, which is right. the latest Gemini Force One audiobook, part of the Jerry Anson audio collection with Big Finish Productions. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yes, the first three episodes of First Action Bureau are already out. I think the fourth one oh. is coming up very shortly. That's wow. all for free as well. Great, great. I mean, That's incredible. There's yeah. so much free Anderson stuff. I hope you're I enjoying it. Make the most of it. And mm. let us know if you are. Podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Yes, and do let us know if you can pick up quite so much free cron- content anywhere else from any other podcast. <laughs> or content. I quite like that. that <laughs> I thought I got away with that. That sounds very uh, sort of spacey, doesn't it? It does. You're right. Is it a planet? Yes, a creon or a, tent, perhaps. Or a <laughs> creon tent. He had to get a space priest he mentioned <laughs> in there. Uh, now, Richard, one of the other releases, uh, which we'll probably talk about in the news, obviously, yeah. is... Uh, Space mm. Precinct Revisited. Yes. Shall I talk a little bit about that? I'd love you to talk yeah. about that now. Yeah, is that okay? All right. Yes. Well, this is, as the title might suggest, a revisit to the Space Precinct universe. Four brand new short stories set in and around the Space Precinct series, featuring all your favourite characters, uh, Captain Podley, Slow-Mo, Brogan, of course, and Haldane, Castle Took, plus a few others make a few guest appearances. Let me just Ooh. say, um, oh, well, there's the odd Clyburn. There's a Melazoid. Ah. Uh, Bertha Fluss's granddaughter makes an appearance. Ooh. I mean, if you know the series well, then uh, that might uh, just whet your appetite. <laughs> if Four you don't know brand new stories. <laughs> yes, it'll mean nothing to you. <laughs> but that's all coming very soon in audiobook and in print, I believe. It is also in print form and ebook. Now, if you don't know Space Precinct, mm-hmm. is it best to start with Space Precinct Revisited or is it best to start with Space Precinct Demeter City? I mean, you can dive straight in. You'll oh, get to you? know the characters fairly quickly. But if you're a completist like me, you'll want to read the Demeter City, the sort of uh, unscreened pilot episode that was adapted and uh, uh, released earlier this year. Then you'll want to watch the whole series on a DVD, ah. of course, available from the uh, Jerry Anderson store. Correct. And then you might want to uh, dive into Space Precinct Revisited and see where these new stories slot into the uh, into the narrative. You are quite right. Eh? Gosh. There's so much stuff to enjoy in the world of Jerry Anderson. 
Incredible. I might as well come along and spoil it with this week's Fab Fact. Oh, we were doing so well. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. Fab Facts. Yeah, Richard's favourite section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine too. If it's quick. Uh, same with many of the listeners. Well, now you've said that, let me uh, ponderously tell you about what Fab oh. Facts is. Fab Facts is a section of the show where I have a book of Fab Facts and uh, I flip through the book at a random point during the said flipping. Richard Mm. shouts the word Fab. That indicates to me that I should stop flipping through the Fab Facts and hopefully alight on a Fab Fact. Then I will read to you that Fab Fact and will agree at the end of the Fab Fact that it was indeed Fab. How's that? Yes, okay, come on then. Come on, time is money. Great. Is it? Gosh. (laughs) In that case, do we hurry or take our time? Right, here we go. Book of Fab Facts is flipping now. Fab! Ooh. What? Ah. Eh? Oh. Mm? Well, 1969, Richard. Oh, what a great year. Well, in fact, 1969-70, particularly good year and particularly good topic because it's UFO's 50th anniversary this year, just passed. It is, yes. And this is a UFO-related fact, or will be shortly. Now, sometimes in older shows, which is as you know, you'll come across actors who today are big names. Yes, true. (laughs) uh, But back then, not so much. Uh, Space Precinct is a prime example. Yes, lots of big names in that. Well, uh, I mean, do you want to pick out a couple at random? Richard James? Obviously, massive, uh, massive name. Yeah, uh, Idris Elba? Uh, Yes, obviously huge (laughs) now. Any others? Uh, Ray Winston? Popped up, I think. Exactly. Uh, Stephen Griff. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Francis Barber. Stephen Burkhoff. But you're talking about people who went on to greater things, perhaps. Yeah. Well, I mean, Idris Elba yeah. and Ray Winstone. I mean, uh, Idris yeah. Elba's a great one, for sure. But uh, back in 1994, uh, for Idris Elba and Ray Winston, for example, they were in minor, minor roles mm-hmm. and even had their voices dubbed over by their actors. Oh, Imagine. So, I mean, if you can imagine if Idris or Ray Winston would cast in a kind of a space reason today, they would be in lead roles, whereas then... Of course they would. Yeah. 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 Well, there is one other well-known UK-based actor oh. uh, who these days you would even perhaps call a national treasure. Oh, yeah, yeah. But this particular actor failed to get into an Anderson series, not once, but twice. Oh, shame. First of all, this actor was screen tested for the role of a Shadow Moonbase operative in UFO in full costume. Right. But sadly wasn't hired for the series. Then a few years later, the same actor was cast in a Protectors episode called uh, Petard. Mm -hmm. I guess, hoist by one's own, I assume. Oh, I see. I was thinking of Patrick Stewart. (laughs) Captain (laughs) Petard. No, this actor was supposed to be playing one of Harry Rule's friends. Right. A lady friend, in fact. Ah. So I hid the gender up till now, but it is a a lady actor. But unfortunately, her scene was cut from the finished episode. So despite the fact she was cast, she was never actually in it, in the broadcast version. Wow. So Richard... Can you name this unfortunate actor? Well, I mean, it could be anybody, couldn't it? Well, I mean, throw me some names of, uh, of okay, famous uh, females who Fenella might be... Fielding. No, no, it's not oh. Miriam Margulies either, believe it or not. Really? OK, uh, but thinking of the time, Diana Rigg? I think you're closing in on it. Am I? Yeah. Uh, Diana Rigg, so she was in The Avengers, so somewhere around there. Oh, uh, Linda Thorson. No, no, Another no, Avenger? No, no colder. Joanna colder. Lumley was yes! in the new... Hey! Yes, it's only Joanna oh, Lumley. Yes. Really? Joanna Lumley was almost a shadow moon base girl. Wow. And was filmed for an episode of The Protectors, but uh, sadly we never saw that come to pass. Ah. And of course, within a few years of The Protectors, along comes the new Avengers which is, as you yep. mentioned, Indeed. and uh, she gets the role of Purdy. Yes. It's a smash hit, and suddenly Joanna Lumley is a household name. That's Absolutely right. massive. Wow. It's exactly the sort of name that an Anderson show would be chasing. But by that yeah. point, no more Anderson shows being made, or certainly not live-action ones that you could have uh, Joanna Lumley in. No, that's right. So, yeah, but can you imagine if she'd been a moon base operative in UFO? Yeah, ah, but the thing is, had she got that job, would she then have been available for the new Avengers well, she would have been. So she my, would have been by that point. But she, yeah. so it was. You know, I guess if she maybe got a, got that, then she might have had a bigger role in the Protectors, and then she wouldn't have been in Avengers. In the yeah, Avengers yeah, yeah. That's right. It's all this sort of sliding door scenario, isn't it? If she'd got the part in yeah. UFO, she might not have had much of a career at all. Yeah, you it's just true. don't know. Now, 
she did screen test for UFO, and we've got the stills. We've got the photos of her oh, doing it. Oh, nice. And she makes a, an excellent moon base girl. Yeah. Um, now, a few years ago, when we discovered these stills, we did actually email her agent and say, does she have any memory, any recollection whatsoever? Oh, I could guess what's coming. And, uh, well, the agent um, said, let me investigate. I'll make sure I uh, look into this thoroughly. And yeah. uh, after a, a few weeks, I got an email back and I opened it thinking, oh, great, we yes. get a behind the scenes story. And mm. uh, Joanna sadly has no recollection uh, whatsoever of doing no. this. No, no, there we are. Oh, well, yeah. you so, know, well, oh, hum. So no inside gossip there, but oh, still quite cool that a national treasure was almost in two Jerry Anderson shows, but wasn't. Cool. Imagine how things might have turned out differently. So, well, you know, who knows? Perhaps in future weeks we'll discover that uh, Diana Rigg was almost, you know, Dr. Helena Russell in Space 1999. Yes. Or, That's uh, right. Could on, have a, on a Blackman almost played Venus in Fire Black Star yes. 5. Why not? Why not? <laughs> Yeah, well, could have happened. Well, I mean, they didn't, so... Um, yeah. <laughs> no, but, fair enough. But you never know what stories might come to pass in the future when they say, can you believe Richard James was behind a mask when you're a household name next week? Yeah, time's running out for that, I think, Jamie, but it's a nice <laughs> thought. Wishful thinking. Uh, that <laughs> feels like a great place to bring to a close this week's... Lovely, lovely fact! fact. Uh, in fact, mm. we should say a lovely, lovely fact. It we? was a lum- lovely, 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 lovely yeah, fact. That's great. Good. Uh, now, you are listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Of course, you must, whatever you do, before you go any further, stop what you're doing and subscribe to this podcast on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Leave us a lovely revating and we'll love you forever. And also, just copy that link and post it on all your social media profiles and uh, then maybe your friends will get to hear us too. And they might even enjoy it. Uh, now, we have <laughs> had a few people get in touch with us Not that much <laughs> over the past few days. Is it? <laughs> Uh, they've been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. For example, Steve got in touch to say, Hi, Jamie, Richard, uh, Richard and Jamie. He says, just dropping you this email to let you know that through the episode discussions that the Podstrons are having on the Facebook group on Saturdays, we've introduced new shows to our fellow Podstrons, which is always a good thing. Hurrah! He says that so far we've discussed the first episodes of Thunderbirds, naturally UFO and Lavender Castle, uh, and then next week, uh, 26th of September, so this is a while ago last weekend he said we are going to discuss breakaway so i hope that went well from space 1999 we're all very respectful of each other's views very good steve just the way we like it uh, even though willow expressed uh, the opinion that lavender castle was not her fave well i think we can forgive her this time i think that's totally fine yeah uh ufo was a very interesting discussion as there were many scenes that today would not be shown and i feel mm. this is why they should not says steve be a remake well, mm. I mean, it's not to say that they would remake those same scenes, Steve. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, interesting but, point. Because I did an interview for for the Radio Times about um, UFO's 50th anniversary. Ah, yes. With Mark Braxton. Lovely Mark. So thank you for doing that, Mark. And um, lots of people were interviewed for that piece. And they were asked about a, a remake. And I think the consensus was very much, oh, yes, it should absolutely be remade. It's right for a remake. And I'm right. not sure I agree, you know. Ah. Because so much of it was based around kind of fears of the time and restrictions yeah. in technology and being set in in a future 1980 and yeah. i don't know i feel like the world has changed so much that to adapt it you'll end up losing so right. much of that original show that it, it might lose its spirit i yes. feel like it's a bit of a sort of a time capsule piece mm, interesting where space 1999 of course it seems to be sort of eminently Updatable. Perhaps it's because it's more of a period piece in a sense. Obviously, 1999 really? is, is, yeah, it's well and truly behind us now. So it's sort of like a retro look at the future, isn't it? From the perspective of the past. It's very odd. Uh, it seems well, to work. Yeah, but I mean, you could say the same for UFO. I mean, it was made in 69, 70, set in 80. Yeah. So it was a look yeah. at the future. But yeah, there's more about UFO, which feels dependent on the time it was made. What do you think, yes. Postrons? Email us, mm. podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Uh, UFO remake, yay or nay? Oh, yeah, your name, right, good. Uh, Peter O'Rourke got in touch to say, hello, Jamie slash Richard and Richard slash Jamie. Delete where appropriate, depending on your preferred <laughs> ordering, he says. Ah, he says, oh, and is that Chris I see over there in the background? I hope he knows how to use that mallet he's holding. He's yeah, waving he's Chris, the mallet. Actually. Yes, hi, Chris. Yeah, yeah. What an inventive way to bake a cake. Anyway, says uh, Peter, I started <laughs> watching Jerry Anderson shows as a child back in the 90s. Imagine being a child in the 90s. How strange. And was one of the lucky few who somehow managed to get the actual trace 
Fantasy Island toy, complete with folding palm trees, sliding swimming pool, and impractically short Thunderbird 2 launch ramp. He said, I started listening to the podcast in March and being a glutton for punishment, uh, his words, I listened to the entire back catalogue from Pod 1. It's helped Gosh. to keep me sane at work during the lockdown. Well, perhaps sane is the wrong word. In any case, I, I heard you ask in a recent pod if anyone could play a Jerry Anderson theme on any instrument. In fact, says Peter, about a month ago, I decided to have a go at recording the disco section of the Space 1999 theme as closely to the original as I could. There are three tracks of electric guitar, uh, Fender Stratocaster, and one of electric bass, my trusty Yamaha, with a sequenced rhythm track to finish it off. It's short, nice. but hopefully sweet. Keep up the good work, chaps, and hopefully I'll email again soon. I do have a very specific and geeky fab fact that crosses over with another popular sci-fi institution but i'm still trying to work out how to word it in a way that actually makes it seem interesting yours explosively <laughs> peter overall listen peter it doesn't matter about it being interesting as we know just uh, you know send it in <laughs> it's a chances constant are. battle that we have <laughs> chances are we'll read it out if it's uh, you know of interest we'll certainly give that a go yeah. so yes now peter did send us this excellent file of his version of the space 1999 disco theme Fantastic. Yeah, that was great. Just long enough for a ringtone, I reckon. Yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 yes. Perfect. And then you don't need me going. No, 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 no. No, we can really do without that. So, yes, thanks, Peter. Thanks very much. Now, I do have another sound file, another theme, but I'm. It's so good, I'm going to save it for next week. Mmm. Mmm. You terrible tease. I know, I know. So, you better join us then. All right, then, if I have to. Yeah. All for now on the email front, but do get in touch with us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk with your comments and thoughts and queries and reviews, and uh, we'll read them out next time. Yes, and any, we? anything else you want to say, really. Sure, yeah. I mean, if you've got a, a random bit of general news unrelated yeah. to anything Anderson, I think we'll happily yeah. read that out as well. <laughs> yeah, we'll take anything. <laughs> Literally anything. Whatever we can get these days. Yeah. But don't worry, Richard, there are sections of this podcast that keep on giving. Just like the Jerry Anderson News. Ah! Go on. Newsy, news, 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 news. I thought you were going to do the Space 1999 version. There. I could have done. I could have done. Chose not to. Okay, next time. Uh, anyway, yes, there is lots of Jerry Anderson news, so let's get started. Stop the podcast. Oh, pods are on. It's Jamie here. And once again, I've managed to mess up the news. Um, Richard and I read the wrong news when we recorded this, so I'm jumping in to very quickly give you a rundown of the latest things that have been happening recently in the world of Jerry Anderson. Uh, first up, I know it's a bit early, but uh, we are in only double-digit days until Christmas now. The Thunderbird's Christmas Jumper is in stock and shipping if you've pre-ordered it is on the way. If you have not, well, it won't be on the way yet, but it could be soon if you do order one. It's a lovely royal blue design this year, designed by Chris Thompson. Would you believe that? Chris Thompson designing something? Never. Well, he has designed this, and uh, it's rather lovely. It's very comfy and warm, and I would love it if you grab them before they sell out. For Thunderbirds fans, uh, you guys may well have heard the Genesis of Thunderbirds audio uh, report that Chris Dale produced using archive audio of Dad that was recorded in the 90s. Well, he's finally put some uh, some video to it. That's on the Jerry Anderson YouTube channel right now. Just search Genesis of Thunderbirds and you will find it there. It's really good uh, and fantastic to see archive clips, uh, film clips of the Lenged mine disaster that inspired Thunderbirds. First Action Bureau is obviously out. Episode four will be coming this Thursday, Thursday the 8th of October from 5 a.m. Uh, if you haven't given it a try yet, please do amazing reviews i've been incredibly touched actually by everything that uh, people have been saying and tweeting so thank you so much for that i'm so glad you're enjoying it 
six more episodes to come after this Thursday. That's seven more in total, giving a total of ten. And uh, a lot of you have also been asking about getting it on CD. Uh, we have put it out for free. We are putting it out for free, but uh, some of you would like to own a physical version of that. I can confirm that the physical version will be a 90-minute audio movie edit of First Action Bureau rather than in these 10-minute episodes. And you can order it right now from the Jerry Anderson store. It'll be available in December. So there's a bit of First Action Bureau for you. And uh, from the sublime to the ridiculous, some might think, 1010, that's Terrorhawks Day, the 10th of October, this coming Saturday. We should have some fantastic Terrorhawks features on the YouTube channel. And Chris Thompson, Chris Thompson again, would you believe it, has created a rather lovely Terrorhawks Day design, which you can grab this weekend only. I should also add that due to popular demand, the Thunderbirds Day t-shirt design has been continued for an extra three days. People saying they can't get it yet because they've been waiting for payday or they you know, just need some extra time to grab it. So it's available until Wednesday, the 7th of October. We can't extend it any further beyond that. So uh, still time to grab that if you want it. And I think that's probably about it. There'll be some other bits and pieces happening around the world of Jerry Anderson, I'm sure. But uh, because I've managed to mess up this bit of news, for now, it's the end of this week's Messed Up Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. That was the news. Lovely. Yeah. I was, again, sort of hoping that you were going to go back into the Space 1999 thing then, but you... I'm you sorry. Well, I'm a constant it. disappointment, as my father-in-law is very fond of telling me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you and I would get on. <laughs> yes, you probably would. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? I keep saying it, but here we are in sort of partial lockdown in the UK here. It's wherever you are in the country, we're under various different sets of restrictions. Mm. But still, there's new stuff happening in the Jerry Anderson universe. There Incredible. absolutely is. In fact, just while we've been recording this, I've seen a rather exciting email drop into my inbox from... Uh, oh. Well, I... Someone. Yeah. It's right. a, a name you'd know, and it's oh. rather exciting. So... You know, are you all right to carry on, or do you want to? No, 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 no. Let's go, let's, yeah? let's carry on. Oh, I, I don't need to reply fine. to it. I'm just looking at it, going, "Oh, that's exciting, isn't it?" Yeah. 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 And one day Good. we'll be able to refer back to this moment, hopefully, and say you that was will. the moment. Imagine that. Yeah. Don't forget, a little later on, we've got Chris Dale coming up with his randomizer, of course. Hi, Chris. So hang over that and see what he's watching this week. But I'm going to turn, with your permission, to Twitter, um, where people. Hang on. Yeah. Let me. Is that, I'm what? just. I'm it, just finding your, the permission. Oh. Oh, it's just okay. There you go. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Let's Remember? slip. Right, great. Yeah, thanks. Now, people have been hashtagging us, Jerry Anderson podcast. They've been tagging him. I'm Jamie Anderson. Me, Richard N. James, and uh, him standing just over there with the ballot baking. Chris Dalek with their thoughts. For example, now John Hammond got in touch to say, "I thought that the fine people of the hashtag Jerry Anderson podcast might appreciate this, particularly Richard James. Having a sort through some boxes at home, I came across the." Sp- Base Precinct board game and Lieutenant Brogan figure. I forgot I had these. Such an unexpected treat to have found them after all this time. Mm. Pretty sure I have more somewhere, he says, albeit loose figures, including Officer Orin himself. Once found, I shall send a photo. Always love Space Precinct, an underrated show, in my opinion. Mm. Well, you know, there's a, more than a few people that might agree with you there. John McDonald said, Jerry Anderson was a TV icon for decades, and his legacy is being celebrated every week on the top pod listed above on this tweet by his son Jamie and friends. A new free audio drama encompassing other Jerry Anderson worlds is also out on October the 1st in pod format. Please subscribe, says John McDonald. It's going to be great, I'm sure. Please do subscribe. Thank Mm, you. And by now, you'll know. Tessa Wyatt tweeted, With an hour and a half left to survive of my second night shift, not only am I now super excited for the first series of Firestorm to come out, she's been listening to pods 21 and 22... (laughs) <laughs> but, she says, I'm also excited for First Action Bureau coming down the line on the 1st of October. Yes, Tessa, so you would have heard, perhaps by now, the first couple of episodes, let us know what you think. And finally, this is a rather nice one, and I hope they don't mind me reading out. This is from Cymru Nerd Cave, who said, I only discovered the podcast pretty recently, to be fair, as I've been getting back into all the good stuff, but I'm loving it so far. You do a great job, and you've been helping me through what's been, let's face it, a bit of a tough year. Oh. So thanks for that. Well, our pleasure. Yes, very, very happy to hear that. That is basically what we're here for. It is, isn't it? In a nutshell, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah giving you free stuff. Well, free stuff and a bit of and a bit of fun, and you know, yeah. At the at worst, you'll be thinking, well, at least I'm not those two. Well, that's well. There's a lot to be said for that. And at yeah. best, hopefully, you'll actually enjoy the content <laughs> and the freebies and the the nonsense. So it's win-win, really, isn't it? 
Exactly. Yes, yeah, so do get in touch with us on Twitter and hashtag us Jerry Anderson Podcast. We love to see your tweets. I'll read them out next time. And a little later on, we'll be uh, popping over to our um, Facebook group. See what they've been up to. Oh, so I yeah. think we're going to do that now. I was I nah, was staring I'll off into the, into the clouds here. Yeah, you've got that thousand yard stare thing going yeah, on. Uh, mm. Right, I'm snapping back into it. No, okay. Come on. No, right. It's time for some more yep. free, free, free stuff. Great. So, if Cake? you, well, no, 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 no not yet. All right. Maybe later. Okay. But um, right. if you are new to the worlds of Jerry Anderson, or whether you're old to the worlds of Jerry Anderson, <laughs> Gemini Force One may or may not mean something to you. If you've listened to the podcast, you will have heard author M. G. Harris talk about it. But it was Dad's final attempt to kind of create something new in Thunderbirdsy towards the end of his life. He wasn't able to complete it in his lifetime, but the books were finished by M.G. Harris. Uh, book one was read as an audiobook by Jacob Dudman, and book two is being read by Wayne Forrester. Um, oh. The books will be out about now, but we thought we would give you three chapters of Gemini Force One Ghost Mine to enjoy. If you like it, and you are an Anderson insider, you will get it for free very shortly cool. if you haven't already got it so do pop along to Anderson Insiders if you want more from your Jerry Anderson fan experience but if you'd just like to enjoy Gemini Force One Ghost Mine for free then here's three chapters now Chapter 1 Rock Snakes of Mars The queue for the tour t-shirts was insane posters too Someone had seriously underestimated how popular Rock Snakes of Mars would be. Ben Carrington was fairly certain that they hadn't been this sizzling hot six months ago when he'd watched them perform at the Carrington Sky High Hotel in Abu Dhabi. When did the snakes go mainstream? He murmured to Jasmine Dietz, who stood beside him in the line. Or is it just here? Bit odd being huge in Switzerland and nowhere else. The question seemed to amuse the 15-year-old daughter of Gemini Force's chief of operations. Duh, rock snakes are big news everywhere. That new album, XLV, it's number one in five countries. Their lead singer, dating that girl from the new Disney Channel show? She dimpled with a smile for him. A couple of months on GF1 and you're already this much out of the loop. Ben just shrugged. He could have told Jasmine about the 6am starts, the hour of cardiac and weight training he did in the fitness room each morning, alongside Gemini Force crew members. He could have told her about the technical manuals he was studying, the fight simulators, and the chores he'd been assigned, cooking and laundry. He could have told her about the daily training sessions in the Israeli Defence Force's martial art, Grav Maga, or how their trainer, James Winch, had informed the crew that they had to get serious with this stuff. Gemini Force was on the radar of at least one wanted villain, Minos Winter. It stood to reason other bad guys wouldn't be far behind. Jason Truby didn't plan for Gemini Force to be any kind of paramilitary group, James had reasoned, but we have to be prepared to defend ourselves. Not every disaster is caused by an accident or what the insurance companies like to call an act of God. Minos Winter isn't the first guy that someone hired to create mayhem. He won't be the last, either. So, Krav Maga, every day. Ben's muscles and bones had ached from the strain of it. He moved beyond grunts of pain as he took blows that got harder as he became stronger. Until one day he reacted with lightning speed, Two swift defensive kicks in succession and a drop roll. James Winch had rewarded him with a tight smile. Muscle memory, he'd said, finally. Ben could have told Jasmine all of this, but he just sucked in a breath of ice-cold air and gave her a wry grin. I've been kind of busy. It had been almost two months since Ben had last seen her. When Michael Dietz had invited him and Rigel back to Switzerland for a few days at the end of the year, the thought of seeing Jasmine had been part of the attraction. Ben kind of missed hanging around with someone closer to his own age. Life on GF1. I'm enjoying it, Ben said. But don't get me wrong, it's no picnic. Jasmine punched him gently in the left arm. That's what you were looking for, though, yes? Something intense? To take your mind off your mother's death? If you say so, Ben said, with a slight shake of his head. But he didn't deny it. 
At first, Ben had found Jasmine's bluntness a little hard to take. He wasn't used to being around girls all that much and hadn't met anyone quite like her. With no sisters and spending most of the past six years in boys-only boarding schools, girls were a bit of a mystery. His old school had organised mixes with girls from nearby schools, but the weird way girls behaved at those events had put him off trying to get a girlfriend. Pity there isn't a manual that can explain girls, he mused, half to himself. Jasmine turned to him with an enigmatic smile. Oh, but there are, lots. We're very easy to understand. So your boyfriend, does he understand you? Ben leaned against the brick wall, his freezing fingers stuffed in the pockets of his North Face windcheater jacket. He'd been in the subtropical climes of GF1's Caribbean location for long enough that he'd forgotten how to dress for an alpine winter. Gloves would have been a good move tonight. Jonah? She said. Obviously not, or I wouldn't be at a concert with another boy. Oh, said Ben, keeping his voice deliberately flat. I see. He turned away, pretending to peer at the merchandise booth. He was surprised to hear from her own lips that Jasmine wasn't a thousand percent into Jonah. Even more surprising was the warm feeling it gave him to hear it. They were only five customers away from the front of the line. The Rock Snakes show had finished almost an hour ago, but there were still hundreds of fans around. Think I'm gonna get a few shirts for the guys back on GF1. They'll get a kick out of us all wearing the same. She eyed him quizzically. Why? They're all in uniform anyway. Ben puffed a cloud of freezing breath up into the fringe of his light brown hair. Not me. It was a tiny bone of contention between Ben and Jason Truby, the founder and leader of Gemini Force. Although Truby had agreed to let Ben spend time on the base during a year off before he started sixth form, he hadn't agreed to let Ben become fully part of the team. Ben trained with them, went on drills and exercises, had even been allowed to assist in a couple of minor rescues, but he hadn't yet pulled on the anthracite grey uniform of Gemini Force, made entirely from a customised Kevlar fabric. Maybe it was just a symbol, but symbols mattered. Ten minutes later, they left the arena in Bern, with drawstring and tote bags stuffed with T-shirts, key rings and plush black and red snakes with beady plastic green eyes, the band's mascot, Dylan. Michael Dietz's home was dark when Ben and Jasmine arrived. The apartment was situated on the edge of the city, near the River Ara, in the southeastern suburb of Bern. Ben and Jasmine found Rigel waiting eagerly, tail wagging his whole body. In his jaws, the dog picked up his lead from where it lay on the floor of the spacious entrance hall. With hopeful eyes, he presented it to Ben. Yucky dog spit, Ben said cheerfully, rubbing the head and ears of his flat-coated retriever. Hope you haven't been eating any dog poop, old boy. Jasmine wrinkled her nose and said in a lowered voice, he does that? Gross. Ben grinned. Ha! No, not any more. But he used to. Pups do that. He fastened the metal clip to Rigel's collar. Can you tell Dietz I'm going to take him for a walk? She looked surprised. This late? It's so cold. Jasmine's father, Michael Dietz, appeared in the doorway to the living room. He was barefoot, dressed in pyjama bottoms and a long-sleeved T-shirt. His thick grey hair was still gelled into a slightly unruly pompadour, so he probably hadn't yet gone to bed. No need, he said, with a nod towards Rigel. I already took him. Ben's doggy is trying to take advantage of his master's good nature. Now you kids need to come inside and talk. Dietz looked at Ben, his eyes serious. Jason Ruby has been in touch. They went into the darkened living room, and settled onto the couch opposite the windows. Outside, Ben could see the pale reflection of an almost full moon on distant mountain peaks. Jason wants you to do some mountain training. Ben nodded. Yeah, that's part of why I'm here. It's been ages since Rigel did anything at altitude. I want to spend a couple of days with him, camping, maybe a bit of climbing, laying some trails for him, all of that. 
Jason thinks it wouldn't be a bad idea for some of the Gemini Force guys to join you. They could use the altitude training too. Dietz turned to Jasmine. You might be interested as well. He wants you all to heli up above the snow line. There could even be some skiing. Jasmine gave a little shrug of her shoulders. Sure, always fun to start the ski season early. I bet you ski pretty well, Ben said approvingly. He'd never met a Swiss who didn't. Jasmine was offered a trial for the Olympic squad, Dietz said with a touch of pride. Ben stared. Serious? She laughed. They might have been, but I wasn't. I won some junior medals for ski cross. So what? I didn't want to compete. Athletes have no lives outside of sport. Ski cross, Ben said. Epic. Still, nice to be asked, right? I mean, I'm okay on skis, but you wouldn't get me doing those crazy stunts. I'll tell Jason yes, shall I? Deet said. Ben and Jasmine shared a smile. I guess, said Ben. I mean, it's probably an order, isn't it? Dietz shook his head slowly. It could have been Ben's imagination, but he fancied that he glimpsed a crafty grin twitching at the edges of Dietz's mouth. What you do as a result of your association with Gemini Force must be of your own free will, Ben. This could involve some physical challenges that you'll find rather taxing. Sounds like a laugh, Ben said. I'm up for anything. I was born and raised in the mountains, Dietz. Born and raised. All right, then, said Dietz. The crafty smile intensified. Get some sleep. You'll need it. Chapter 2 Lightning Start He felt a hand gripping his shoulder, shaking him awake. In his ear, a harsh whisper. Lightning start. We leave in five. By the time Ben turned his face towards the voice, whoever had woken him had gone. Ben had become accustomed to fast starts, straight from bed. It was part of the training at GF1. Since each member of the team shifted their personal clock by an hour each day on a staggered timetable, someone was always dragged out of bed for the lightning starts. Disasters have no timetable. Gemini Force isn't the fire service. We aren't the police. Paramedics go home to their ordinary lives. But that's not us, Truby had told Ben. With us, it's a full-time job. And that means 24-7. Ben was dressed and had Dietz and Rigel in the kitchen within four minutes. He didn't bother with washing on lightning starts. He got pretty sweaty doing rescue work anyway. He didn't see the point of wasting precious time just to start the day smelling like soap. Rubbing his eyes with the back of one hand, he gave Rigel an absent-minded pat with the other. The dog responded only with a soft whine as he crunched breakfast, a carefully measured serving of dry dog food. Ben reached for two pieces of the peanut butter on toast that Dietz was heaping onto a plate. Jasmine arrived three minutes later. Like Ben, she'd dressed for the mountains. Hiking trousers, a figure-hugging cream microfleece, mahogany leather climbing boots. Her long brown hair was neatly brushed away from her face. Her hazel eyes were bright and lively. When she sat next to him, he caught a whiff of honey and vanilla. You washed, he said and smiled. Classic noob maneuver. Are you kidding? I'd have to be in a burning building before I'd leave the house without at least a wash. That's kind of the point, Ben said. He passed Jasmine the plate, watched her take one triangular piece of toast. The people we're trying to save might be. Rather you than me, she said. Don't get me wrong, I like to visit, but the Gemini Force isn't my idea of a career. I prefer something more creative. Still, I bet there's loads you could do on GF1, began Ben, but he caught sight of Dietz shaking his head. Behind his daughter, Dietz raised a single finger to his lips and smiled. Ben heard the sound of lift doors sliding open. Each apartment had access to the building's storage rooms. There were footsteps in the entrance hall. Someone was carrying something back and forth to the lift, Ben concluded. Who else is here? 
he asked Dietz. Eat, Dietz advised. He handed them each a sealed bottle of spring water, plus an extra one for Ben. For Rigel, Jasmine stood. I'll fetch my day hiking pack. Dietz shook his head. Nope, this time you go empty-handed, apart from water. Addison Nicole Dyer, Gemini Force's newest pilot, strolled into the kitchen. She was dressed in thermal trousers and a winter-weight hiking jacket and boots. Her dark brown, sleekly bobbed hair matched the chocolate colour of her jacket. She clapped gloved hands together. Dudes, let's go. From this moment, consider this a training mission. Paul Scott is the superior crew member, so he's El Capitano. If you want to withdraw at this point, okay. Once we're on the mountain, you're going to need to follow orders. It can turn pretty life or death up there, as you should both know. A mobile phone buzzed twice. Addison reached into her pocket, reacting to what she saw on screen with a wry grin. Scuzzball, she announced. Ben said, Pardon? The go word. Truby's changed it to scuzzball, as of now. Jasmine turned to Ben. Go word? It's like a code, he said. If one of us says it, it means trouble. It means get the heck out of Dodge without a glance at what you leave behind. And you're supposed to just go? Ben nodded. It's not meant to be used unless you're pretty sure you're going to die and the rest of the team is at risk. Jasmine frowned. Wow, I'm kind of glad my dad gets to stay on GF1 if it's like that. Oh, hardly ever, Addison said lightly. Rigel approached the pilot with the suppressed eagerness of a well-trained but delighted dog. Hey, boy, she said, rubbing him behind the left ear. You want to come ride in a heli? She glanced at Ben and Jasmine expectantly. Good to go? As one, Ben and Jasmine rose to their feet. GTG, said Ben. The adrenaline was beginning to flow quite nicely. He wasn't quite sure what Paul and Addison had planned, but they were managing to inject a bit of drama into the mission, which he appreciated. It couldn't match the pure adrenaline spikes you got when things really started to happen, but still. It was a short drive through the deserted early morning streets, out of Bern and onto the highway, towards the small town of Belbe. Soon enough, they reached the small bern belbe airport and were driving towards the private charter section, where Ben could already see the waiting Robinson R-44 helicopter. He felt a stab of sorrow as he looked at the helicopter that his mother had once purchased for her own startup rescue agency, the Carolinas. There was no point thinking about it. But once in a while, Ben couldn't help but remember that if the Carolinas hadn't gone bust, along with every other business owned by the Carringtons, then maybe his mother would still be alive. Fate had chosen a different path for his mother, and for him. Now his life was physically and mentally more gruelling than he'd imagined was possible, without actually being in the armed forces. He rarely complained, though. Every time he got hurt in training, every time he felt too tired to do a lightning start, every time he found it hard to fall asleep at midday because his internal clock had wound twelve hours ahead, Ben just swallowed each negative thought. Truby had given Ben an amazing opportunity, letting him spend a year on GF1. He wasn't about to ruin that by whining. That was the first important thing. And the second? Jasmine was right. Life on GF1 left Ben with no energy to feel sorry for himself about losing his parents and the family fortune which was just how he wanted it. He took his place in the rear of the R-44, sliding in next to Rigel and Jasmine. He'd offered to help Paul load four medium-sized rucksacks into the luggage compartment. The Australian pilot had politely but firmly refused. Ben couldn't stop a nagging feeling that Paul was keen to take absolute control of the training mission, even deciding exactly what equipment they should each take. Paul hadn't even consulted him on what to bring for Rigel. Pretty vexing. 
Ben himself wouldn't have done it that way. Surely getting suitably equipped was part of the job. If he ever organised a mountain survival session, Ben would make their first task the selection of appropriate kit. The R-44 was up in the air and flying below a high bank of thick white cloud. Straight ahead, the south of the city, the line of peaks in the Bernese Alps was just visible. Only the summits of the Mönch and the Jungfrau were shrouded in mist. Ben sunk his fingers into the thick, soft black fur at the base of Rigel's neck. He massaged the dog's muscles as Rigel bent his head and nuzzled affectionately against Ben's thigh. It was really very odd that no one had thought to ask Ben about what equipment he'd need for Rigel. The dog's training was Ben's responsibility, no one else's. He ought to have been given time to put together a training plan. So, guys he said, loud enough to be heard in the front, over the clatter of the rotor blades. What's the plan? I was hoping to be able to get in some specific training for Rigel. It'd be great if I could get a heads up, you know? Help me to think up some stuff to do with him? Don't you worry about that, replied Paul. We'll talk about all that tomorrow. Today is just for getting in some skiing on fresh, fresh powder and some obligatory apres ski. Paul's response wasn't quite what Ben had hoped for. Sure, he wanted to have fun. It had been months since he'd skied. Memories of the previous season came flooding back. San Anton with his mother at Christmas, and again in February, Mount Cook in New Zealand with both parents in July, just a week before his father's death in the Annapurna region of the Himalayas but they only had a few days to spare. Time that would be more usefully spent training. You don't seem too excited, Jasmine observed. I guess heli-skiing is no big deal to you, but I've never done it. Me too, called out Paul. Me three, said Addison, leaning back for a second to smirk at Ben. Never even been on skis, so don't you be the buzzkill. I am excited, Ben objected and stopped there. No one was actually saying it, but he was getting a faint vibe from them, like he was some spot rich kid who was trying hard to appear blasé. They all fell silent as Addison piloted the helicopter over the looming Eiger North Wall. Towards the craggy rock and ice of the shark-tooth-shaped Schreckhorn. Paul turned to face Ben and Jasmine, We're headed for the Bernese Oberland Glaciers. Addy's going to drop us off near the high-altitude ski hut, where we've ordered ski equipment, maps, and a sledge for Rigel. We'll take a kit, ski to where the snow ends, to our mountain hut. Finding it, that's the first task. Next, we'll hike down into the valley, find the nearest village, grab a ride home. Pretty straightforward bit of skiing and hiking. Shouldn't be out longer than two nights. And tomorrow, Ben... On the way down to the valley, you could do some trail work with Rigel. Ben had to admit it was a great-sounding plan. He settled back into his seat, one hand still on Rigel's throat. Life on GF1 could get pretty intense. Maybe he just needed to remember how to chill. Chapter 3 Gone That's the best powder I've ever skied on, and the views, amazing. Paul Scott nodded his vigorous agreement with Jasmine's comment, delivered over a mug of steaming cocoa. They made such good time that Paul had suggested they passed up spending the night at the luxurious climber's lodge en route and continued to a genuine mountain hut. We can reach it in about an hour if we go fast. Then, Ben, if you're so keen to do some work with Rigel you'll have more time. You couldn't accuse the mountain hut of luxury, but then again, this trip wasn't just for pleasure. The views today had been impressive, but with the sky a blanket of low cloud, it wasn't all that obvious where the mountains ended and the sky began. Ben had enjoyed far more spectacular days of heli-skiing with his parents, but he kept that to himself. Paul and Jasmine had never done this before, There was something exhilarating about experiencing anything together when it was someone's first time. 
He wasn't going to spoil that for any of the group. Ben had insisted on pulling Rigel's sled himself. Paul and Jasmine had offered to take a turn, but he had refused. He might be on his own with a dog one day, in a life-threatening situation. He had to know he could manage alone. Several times Paul and Jasmine had paused, waiting for Ben and Rigel to catch up. Then they'd set off again without giving Ben a chance to rest. He'd arrived at the hut out of breath, his undershirt damp with sweat, in spite of the biting cold. The mountain hut had taken some finding. It had once been a cattle shelter. The building conversion hadn't managed to get the acrid stink of silage out of the wood in that half of the hut. There was only one bedroom, with four double bunks. The bathroom had hot running water and a chemical toilet. It was on the smelly side of the house. The living area was equipped with a wood-burning stove, an assortment of stainless steel pots and pans hung from sturdy hooks in the low ceiling. Once they'd arrived and put their ski equipment into the boot cupboard to dry out, they'd set about unpacking the rucksacks that Paul had prepared. Ben was relieved to see that everything he could think of was there. Rigel's wearable computer technology collar, walkie-talkies, a harness for carrying the dog, an assortment of climbing gear, a GPS locator, an emergency survival kit. The pack that had come down the slopes next to Rigel on the sled was filled with food and drink. Ben had taken the milk and a generous wedge of local mountain cheese. He'd found a dry, empty, insulated box under the low, rough pine table in the living area. He'd packed it with snow and placed the milk and cheese inside. The rest of the supplies, pasta, pellets of dog food, plastic containers of sauce, a hunk of German salami, a loaf of sliced bread, cereal bars, chocolate bars and apples, he'd put on the square of kitchen sideboard next to the stove. Paul had cooked for them, pasta with salami and cheese. They leaned back onto the hard cushions of the bench sofa and raised mugs of cocoa to a great day on the mountain. Rigel had crouched at Ben's feet, a towel draped around him. On the way down, the dog had taken to the snow every so often, bounding along beside Ben on the sledge, until he'd tired from the effort. The dry powder that had caked around his body had begun to melt. An aroma of damp dog fur slowly encircled them. After the exhausting day, sleep had descended with surprising, almost overwhelming speed. Ben was usually a light sleeper, but he woke to find the cold glare of white light in his face. It streamed relentlessly through the thin curtains. He took several minutes to stir. Puzzled, he sat up. He checked his watch. How could it already be ten o'clock? In the bunk opposite, Jasmine was still fast asleep, cosy inside her mummy-shaped sleeping bag. On Paul's bunk, a crumpled sleeping bag lay empty. The black towel that Rigel had slept on lay in a heap on the pinewood floor. Ben stood up. He felt unsteady, still half asleep. Maybe it was the relentless physical exercise of the previous day, even so, it was unusual for his body to be so reluctant to recover. As soon as he emerged from his sleeping bag, Ben wrapped his arms around his chest, tucked both hands under his arms. It was cold enough to see his breath. He glanced at the bathroom. Its door was slightly ajar. The room was empty. He listened for a moment. The hut was silent. An ominous feeling began to stir within him. Ben stepped into the living area. This was his first real shock. Two backpacks were open, partially inside out, apparently discarded at the corners of the room. The contents, mainly clothes, had been strewn randomly around the room. Of the other two backpacks, there was no sign. He checked the kitchen sideboard. What was left of the food they'd brought was gone. Ben drew a deep, shaky breath. It was so quiet that he could still hear the faint sound of Jasmine stirring in the bedroom. He went to the front door, opened it. It hadn't been locked, which was pretty normal in the mountains in Ben's experience, even in villages. Outside, the snow was like a smooth white river that flowed from the front door, continued down the slope for about a hundred metres, 
and then petered out. And the cold. Within seconds he could feel heat being sucked out of him, leaving his body through the exposed skin on his face and hands. His cheeks twitched at the bite of it. His eyeballs seemed suddenly dry like stones. Teeth chattering, Ben closed the front door to the hut. He stood absolutely still, listening. Nothing. Not even the sound of birds, since the trees only began a hundred metres away. Quieter even than yesterday, when most of the time there'd been nothing but the swish and shush of their own skis and the virgin snow. Slowly, Ben went back into the hut, closed the door firmly behind him. He went to the wood-burning stove in the corner. A brushed steel chimney reached into the ceiling. He warmed his hands for a few moments on the stove. He took one of the remaining five wedges of wood from the neatly arranged heap by the stove and fed it into the dying fire. Then he went back into the bedroom. As gently as he could, he woke Jasmine. She seemed groggy too. Yawning, she joined him on the sofa. Where's Paul? Something's happened. <laughs> what do you mean? Ben gathered up a few pieces of clothing from what had been scattered around. Paul's gone. He's taken the food, all the equipment, and Rigel. Paul's left us? Looks like it. Jasmine seemed doubtful. I can't believe we didn't hear him. Yeah, well, I don't normally sleep from 9.30 till 10 the next morning. She glanced at him. You think he gave us something? Slipped us a Mickey Finn. Yep, I do. What about Rigel? Ben considered. Must have given him something too. Rigel wouldn't have left without a fuss. He picked up his hiking boots. Do you want to get changed in the bedroom? I'll change in here. Once he was dressed, Ben checked more thoroughly. This had to be some kind of test. But as he realised just how comprehensively they'd been cleaned out, his pulse rate began to climb. The only thing he found was a climbing harness. Without it, there was no way to get Rigel down some of the sheer drops they'd surely face on the descent into the valley. He tried not to think about the implications of this and focused instead on the available food. To his relief, the icebox was closed, apparently forgotten. Floating in the snow melt was about half a litre of milk and most of the cheese. Jasmine returned wearing full hiking gear. With a rueful expression, she held out a large bar of Cayenne milk chocolate. I always keep some in my jacket when I'm in the mountains. I've also got lip balm, aspirin, gum, and, weirdly enough, dental floss. Ben reached for his North Face jacket, which lay in a pile on the floor. As he picked it up, he saw the edge of a red plastic box about 30 centimetres long, marked with a Swiss flag. The emergency kit. With relief, Ben tucked it into one of his inner jacket pockets. He searched through everything one last time. Nothing else turned up. No sign of a map, he said dismally. I guess that's part of the test. He stood up. So... It was to be a survival hike. Minimal supplies, no communication devices, in the freezing cold. A race against the clock, life or death stuff. Because the one thing you did not want to risk in December was to be caught out at night. Ooh, if you want more, you yeah. shall have to join Anderson Insiders or... Just pop along and buy it from the Jerry Anderson store or bigfinish.com. If you are an existing Big Finish customer and want to use the Big Finish app, then I recommend you go to bigfinish.com to get it. If you just want to download it as, as an audiobook file or some MP3s, then you can get it from either place, shop.jerryanderson.co.uk or bigfinish.com. There is another Gemini Force One book, White Storm, coming out in the new year. Wow. And Great. a load of other stuff from the Jerry Anson Audio Collection. And if you want to build out your Jerry Anson Audio Collection and you're a friend of a show called Space Precinct. Mm, it rings a bell. Yeah, it's yeah. not often it gets a mention. No, it's But true. a book called Space Precinct Unmasked oh. is available, written and narrated by 
Oh. Risha. What's his name again? James. James. Yeah. yeah. Great Spanish actor. Uh, right. Yeah. No. Uh, by Richard James. That's you, Richard James. Uh, oh, you've yes. done a lovely, lovely job. It's the behind-the-scenes story of Space Precinct, and um, it's really rather good. Oh, thanks very much. That one is only available from the Jerry Anderson store. It's an exclusive. So uh, pop along and enjoy that too. And uh, we'll be bringing you some more free stuff in the coming weeks. In fact, if this goes down rather well, we'll probably bring you some some free Space Precinct Revisited next week, Ooh, maybe. wow. Yeah, or okay. Or some free Into Infinity Planetfall, possibly. All right, yeah. There's great. lots of stuff we can offer you. So um, come back next week for more free goodness. God, it just gets better and better, doesn't it? Well, as we approach the end, you mean? <laughs> no, we're not there yet. Now, I'm going to head over to our Facebook group. That's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons, where our podsteron Facebook groupers, <laughs> is that a word? Anyway, groupers. they've been having lots of fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sharing their art, quiz nights, talking all things Jerry Anderson. And I picked up a few posts here. For example, Heather Ballard posted, I just got finished listening to the two free chapters of Spectrum File 1 from Big Finish. And uh, I'm about to spend some dollars. As soon as I can get some dollars, I'm kind of broke now. But also, I kind of want to draw it. Lovely, yeah. Heather. I'd like to see those pictures. Now, Abby Svensson, who we all know and love, posed a very interesting question. If you could have an infinite budget to make another season of any Ander show, which would it be? But it has to be one of your least favourites. So you have to take your least favourite Anderson show and make it. Which one would it be? Alex Patrick replied, The Secret Service. It's definitely my least favourite Supermarination show, though it had its moments, and I would have the new season take place from a different priest's perspective, since Bishop was an organisation. Mm. Good point. Did we ever see other agents from, from Bishop in other village I churches? I don't think we did, actually. Yeah. But I did, so I did write a treatment for a, a, a Secret Service reboot. Nice. Um, which started at um, Father Unwin's funeral. Oh, Wow. And his Great. replacement okay. arriving, you see. Nice. So, yeah. I mean, you, oh, Stanley like Allen's not around, so it's tough to. No, no. And that's also, true, I think right. you need some, some, you know, new fresh blood, and you can imagine the, the village where the church is, the sort of yeah. all the old ladies not being very happy about this new replacement vicar. Yeah. It'd be quite oh. fun. Anyway. Yeah. I'm Great. Giving away uh, too much. No, I like it. Uh, Mark Gardner said uh, that he'd reboot Terror Hawks, funnily enough, but he says in live action or super marionation. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and Peter Lippman, finally, if I had enough money, I'd make a new series of The Protectors, my least <laughs> Anderson show, yeah, featuring a different cast, different script writers, different directors, on good old ITC 35mm film, one hour each episode, oh, and different guest stars. <laughs> right. So Fair not The enough. Protectors, pretty so, much? Well, ah, there you go. And finally, this lovely one from Yuhan, who says, though there isn't much that can be discussed about the upcoming Kate Kestrel and the Terrorhawks project, one thing that I genuinely hope gets expanded on, especially with Kate Kestrel's name being in the title, is the music, specifically the songs, if Kate will indeed still have her singing career on the side. Some might find this aspect jarring and cheesy. However, says Yuhan, uh, anime fans such as myself will be at home with this concept. And whilst dealing with record labels is another complicated matter, if done right with good producers and writers, the songs have the potential to stand alongside the show itself. But that's just me hoping that this will actually be explored. Well, well, we'll see you, Han. Interesting. So no for those comment. of you who don't know, yeah, Terror Hawks is indeed the subject of a reboot, Kate Kestrel and the Terror Hawks, and that will be coming to us soon. Quite what it would look like or sound like, we'll have to wait and see. Mm. Mm. So many unknowns, yeah. eh? Well... To most people, yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You see things. I've, I sent I you some things, didn't I? That yep, particularly yep, yep. scary. Uh, yeah. That's anyway. right. So what else is going on over there, Edward? Or is that about it from our Facebook That's group for today? That's it for now. But do drop over to our Facebook page, uh, the group rather. You've got three questions to answer, and if you answer them uh, correctly, I mean it's not a quiz as such. Uh, <laughs> you'll be let in, uh, and you can join in the fun. Yes, it's <laughs> it's definitely not a quiz. It's just, you know, checking you're a fan and not a robot. Now, yes. while you're at, over on Facebook, can I also ask mm. that you go and like the First Action Bureau page? Ah. Oh. There is a First Action Bureau specific Facebook page, which, believe it or not, is at facebook.com slash First Action Bureau. Oh, is it? Yeah, I know it's a bit confusing Great. that uh, we yeah. use that uh, as the yeah. uh, address, but there yeah. you go. But please do pop over and give it a like and, um, and check out the content on there and give it a share if you fancy but whatever you do, make sure you're subscribed to First Action Bureau wherever you get your podcasts, which I suppose is here, wherever you're listening to us. True. Thanks very much. Yeah. Mm. Great. 
Now, Richard James. Yes, Jamie Anderson. One of the reasons people come here and they keep coming back. Yes. Is because there is a part of this podcast where you and I stop talking. Oh, that, the people yearn for that every week. Yeah, now, they? that obviously is the end. But just yeah. prior to that, there is also an extended bit where you and I stop talking. Yeah. And that bit is Chris Dale's marvellous and fabulous randomizer. It's true. Should we just let him take the wheel of the podcast? I think we should. Hopefully he won't crash it. Here you go, Chris. Mm. On your last trip, did you discover what the Earth people watch? They watch a great deal of this. In this episode, a freighter gets blown up by a UFO. The humans go looking for it in their submarine. Then it gets smashed all to bits. They are clearly a most primitive people. This week's So welcome back to UFO on the Randomizer. And uh, oddly enough, this is the episode that... Um, that follows on from the last UFO episode we saw on the Randomizer, which was ESP. Now, some of you might be saying, uh, no, not in any production order or broadcast order that I'm familiar with, was uh, ESP followed by Subsmash. Well, it was when I first saw it, because... Oh, I love that shot of the freighter blowing up. The little alien UFO just comes out underwater and uh, zaps the... Uh, I can't remember what this ship is. It's not the Kingston. Is this the Atlantia or something similar? I mean, the footage is, is absolutely identical the way this is. Oh, Atlantica 4, that's it. Yeah, the footage is almost identical. When we, we see it reused in uh, Reflections in the Water. And I believe this footage was actually one of the UFO clips that was that ended up with world backgrounds and uh, appears in other things. I think I've... The only thing I can remember seeing it in was um, Whoops Apocalypse. It was in an episode of that for some reason. Anyway, Skydiver and Captain Waterman are now out looking for the remains. I'm not quite sure why Skydiver was issued this assignment. Radio Shadow Control. No survivors. Some evidence of UFO. I'm not quite sure what he uh, believes the evidence of a UFO. It could just be an explosion on the ship, but... Uh, there we go. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna doubt Captain Waterman's uh, judgment. Anyway, yes, I said this episode directly follows on from ESP. Uh, when I first saw it in the uh, on the BBC back in. It must be that UFO that came in a month ago under a radar blind spot. Well, um, stayed underwater. The BBC started showing UFO 95ish, I want to say, and then they stopped for some reason after ESP. Uh, they replaced it with uh, with Star Trek, picking up from a it's in a liquid environment uh, from a, re a previous repeat run of that that had also stalled, and then UFO turned up again on the BBC like three years later, and this was the episode they they picked up the run with, not Kill Straight. What else? Anyway, that's uh, rather I took over. Mildly interesting. Much more interesting is this little uh, oh that insight into Straker. Well, the uh, dictionary defines it as a. Morbid dread of confined spaces. Skydiver's not all that small. And you're not always morbid. Exactly. <laughs> oh, Get yeah. Strake is claustrophobic. It's in the South Atlantic area. Which is probably more... There's probably more people suffering from that than, uh, than you might expect, but... Rendezvous point there where we could exchange a sub-cruise. This is weird. Well, there are dozens of small atolls in the area. Mostly uninhabited. This is very weird. This line. I want to be aboard with the best available sub crew as soon as possible. Uh, for two reasons. One, um... So, best available sub crew. Okay. Well, aside from Captain Waterman, they've replaced the entire regular Skydiver crew, which basically means that everyone we've seen on Skydiver 1 for the whole series, presumably the flagship of Shadow's Skydiver fleet, were not the best available. They were like the runners-up. I just find that so strange. It's like, why, why is, why are you not putting your best people where they're needed at all times? Don't get it. I'm needed below, sir. My cabin is at your disposal. Thank you, Captain. The captain's cabin is like the only other room on the ship. I never understood with Skydiver. It, it does just seem to be. Thanks, these commentary reach, sir, Joe. This interior that we, you know, the, uh, I don't know if you call it bridge or. 
control room or whatever, but there doesn't seem to be any other rooms on Skydiver. And what we know about the interior layout of the thing based on the exterior, you know, we, you know where the, the launch tube for Sky One is. You can get an idea of the scale of the people. I can't see where there's any rooms for like quarters or even a bathroom on Skydiver. It's a big place to play cat and mouse. Yes, but we'll just have to make sure that our claws are well sharpened. How do you mean? Well, we're trying to find them. Let's hope that the aliens don't think that we're the mouse. And it's nice to see uh, to see Skydiver get a bit of focus and attention for once. Right, plot a search pattern. Yes, sir. Lieutenant? And here she is. My second reason why Straker's line best available subcrew is so strange. Um, if Nina Barry represents part of the best subcrew for Skydiver, why do they stick her on the moon for most of the series? We'll be going under for a submerged second. Why isn't she permanently assigned to Skydiver? Most of the fresh air. I get maybe she was on leave or something and, and did it as a favour to Straker or something, but it does seem odd. This episode specifically says these people are the best crew for Skydiver. And um Starting vectors. We've only ever seen one of them on here before. Of course. In fact, two of the, the this four-man crew are complete strangers to us. Increasing sweep on 14 degrees port. Although uh Long-time Anderson fans will certainly recognise the voice of Lieutenant Lewis there, Paul Maxwell, uh, who was uh, Steve Zodiac and Captain Grey and Paul Travers and uh, various other roles in Fireball XL5 and Thunderbirds. I'm going below. Right. And also at the controls of Skydiver, we have um, Anthony Chin, who had previously played an alien in UFO. But it's uh, good to see that uh, Shadow's hiring policies of... Uh, they don't hold that against him. Of course, he was later, Who's this? quite soon later, um, Chino in yeah. The Protectors. The escape hatch, Lieutenant. Yes, sir, in training. Our navigator, Lewis, he's the one you want to talk to about those. Oh, never mind. Just familiarizing myself with the ship. Yes, sir. How's it going, Nina? Fine, sir. What is it? Large shoulder fish. Sonar is our best bet. Well, you're the expert. Which is why I stick you on the moon rather than down here. My uh, my assignments sometimes make no sense, Nina. I don't know if you've noticed this. It's a tight ship, Captain. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I do find with Skydiver, the more people we put on that, that set, the smaller it looks. And uh, here we go, Straker's... Oh, he's retired to the captain's cabin, and you can see he's clearly feeling... Uh, he's feeling the, the tightness of the ship, as he said. And again, it's it's all... It's all conveyed through Ed Bishop's facial expressions and uh, him catching sight of his reflection in the mirror here. Just Ed, Ed Bishop, just so amazing in this show, isn't he? Just, oh. I think I've, I've I must have said this before, but yeah, f my favorite Anderson character. And I, I would have to assume that so much of why he's my favorite is just what Ed brings to it. It's hard to imagine anyone else in this role. I'm sure someone else could could fill the basic role of commander, but uh, without Ed Bishop, Increasing. he wouldn't be Straker. Metallic object. I'm moving quite fast. I suppose the, the reason Nina's here is um, how far her role in this story eventually becomes. It, it requires two thousand yards. Increasing. Basically, the best actress on the show to be to be on Skydiver and. UFO at this time they basically had just was it five Dive. Um, so they probably made the right decision it wouldn't make so much sense for for Sylvia Howell to be on board this week as it does to have Nina here but uh, at the same time I just I, I just keep coming back to that if Nina is part of the best skydiver crew why is she always on the moon watercraft sir moving ahead of us anyway looks like we've we've found our underwater UFO Lovely model work on Skydiver, descending into the water there. All those bubbles pumping out of it. Switch on underwater cameras. And Skydiver has always been my, my favourite UFO vehicle. Visibility poor, sir. I, I don't have too many favourite vehicles from UFO. I think it's probably because with the, the designs on this show, they don't seem as uniform. The interceptors, skydiver, the mobiles, the the lunar module—they don't seem to sort of. I can't imagine them as like 
all part of the same vehicle fleet in in the same way that I can with like the Spectrum vehicles or the Terrahawks vehicles or rock formations or even like the various space probes we see in in Space 1999. Each vehicle, each main vehicle in UFO seems to belong to a different organization. We've lost it. But uh, yeah, Skydiver is very cool, despite the fact that as we see soon see in this episode, it uh, it's not really much good in a fight. They've got their underwater lights on. That makes the model look uh, look even more impressive as well. Lots of staring at screens. Is the alien going to show? Is it going to show? There it is. Oh. Oh. Some proper throwing yourself about acting here from, uh, well, everybody really. Oh, chin's down. He's got a... Serious gash on his forehead. Main system still operating. Right surface. Float links one and two. Blowing one and two. And I like this as well. Once they're hit, they they just sort of know they can't really pursue the UFO anymore. They they react the way the crew of a real submarine would. Until. Malfunction on one. Keep trying those tanks. Hold it. Shut down ballast. And I do like really like Gary Myers as well. I, I don't know if I've ever spoken about him before, but. Uh, of the three skydiver captains, I think I find him the most believable. Uh, he's just got something for me that um, Captain Carlin didn't quite have, and uh, who was the other one? David Warbeck, who, who didn't even get a name. Starboard turbine. It's nice to see him go from interceptor pilot to to skydiver captain. It's like, hey, here's this competent, capable guy. Let's give him a bit more responsibility, both within Shadow and uh, and for the actor Gary Myers as well. Anyway. There goes the little UFO. It's heading away, toward the surface. Can we launch Sky One? We can try. There's no going down with the ship for this, Captain. I'm out of here. Alien craft, airborne. <laughs> and that's that slide into Sky One looks so cool. Launch Sky One. Lift off. Roger. And there, there was always a part of me that, um, since this was Captain Waterman's last appearance in the show, um, well, at least in production order. I always thought it would have been a horrible thing to do to the character, but rather in keeping for this show, if um, they sent him down the launch tube into Sky One and the the window had been smashed and they didn't know, and he was he died in the cockpit of Sky One, unable to get out. I, I always thought that would be such a that'd be an awful end for any character, but it would be so in keeping with this show. Anyway, Waterman isn't dead; he's out in Sky One searching for that UFO, and I really do not like the design of this UFO either. Sky one to control. Target destroyed. It's nice that it's a different design from normal, but it doesn't make too much sense considering we've seen regular UFOs underwater before and it just looks so under control. Come in, Sky. Small and, and silly. Contact lost, sir. Even the shot of it exploding doesn't look all that impressive. Down, turbine's non functional. Anyway, the UFO's Actor. Yes, sir. destroyed, but uh power. Looks like Skydiver is, uh, yep, we're going down. Emergency power. Crash positions. Crash positions just means find the nearest pole and or, or wall or whatever and just hold on tight. It was like in the, there's an episode of Space 1999, blast, blast procedure, Koenig calls, and then he goes and crouches behind the, the sharpest corner of a desk that he can find. Anyway, we've hit the bottom. <laughs> good and now here's one of the, the greatest um, I, I don't know what you'd call it aspects I suppose of of having this this story on skydiver having it crippled on the bottom of the sea is they've tilted the set at an angle and instantly this this familiar environment that you're used to of control overflying last known position of diver one's control center is um, Wreckage apparent. Suddenly looks completely different. Knocking negative. Roger, Sky One. Proceed to near Shadow Base. Starting sub smash procedure. Roger. And that's Lou Waterman out of the series, except for a uh, brief bit of stock footage in Mindbender. Don Marker was release, sir. Good. What about the power? Well, we're not getting a warning alarm from the reactor, so the radiation shield must be okay. I've sent Klaus Hergesheimer to investigate those radiation shields, Paul. Sorry to bother you. I'm Klaus Hergersheimer, 
G-section. Checking radiation shields. Well, by now, Sky One will have reported our position, so a rescue team will be on its way. Now, we all know the standing orders regarding the sub-smash, so if we just follow them, we'll be all right. So let's get to it. Colonel Foster. The yeah, the set looks so, so different. And all they've done is tilted it on one side, but... And, and also the escape hatch. Now the actors have to maneuver their way around it as if it's a completely unfamiliar environment. Anyway, Strake has issued orders. Everyone's uh, up on their feet except uh, poor old Lieutenant Chin. Listen, uh, do you feel up to going to stern with me and checking the turbines? Yes, sir. Uh, I love Straker's body language here. The shelf before the rescue team gets here. Yes, sir. When Chin can't see Straker, Straker is looking at Chin with an expression on his face of, you are dead, you are so dead. Trust 2-5 to shadow control. We have positive area location on Skydiver Beacon. Homing on signal now. Roger, Albatross. That's uh, Keith Alexander on the radio there, presumably Keith Ford, and Keith Alexander was back for a, a couple of like radio voices in uh, a few episodes made after this, but we never saw Ford again. Sub-smashers are always different. So Ford could be in charge of shadow control right now, or... I better check things out in the cabin. Maybe they left Colonel Lake there if she actually exists again by this point. And also the shots of um, Skydiver with the, the cable attached to the marker boy that's made to the surface. Later on in the episode, that cable seems to disappear, and I'm not sure why. Anyway, let's assess our situation. Not good. One turbine completely blown, and there's some damage to the reactor cooling plant. Well, that means we can forget the main power supply. How long will the emergency storage batteries last, Chin? The meters register eight hours, and we can't recharge without the reactor. I estimate there's enough air for eight hours. About the same as the batteries. What's the story on our communications, Lieutenant? Main radio knocked out, sonar and radar working. The hydrophone on the marker boy is active, but the power is weak. So we seem to be roundly screwed here. Lieutenant Lewis, I hope you got some good news for us on those escape hatches. Well, there's only one of them operational, sir, number three hatch. And that's got trouble. Well, it, it's working, but the systems check indicates damage. In addition, there's something wrong with the pumps. I reckon it'll take upwards of 90 minutes to empty that hatch. So it's good news all round then. Paul, I'll be in the captain's cabin. Crying and uh, trying to hold it together. And I do like as well this uh, rescue plane, the, the Albatross. It doesn't have shadow markings. Can you get any more speed out of this thing? Oh, will have blown our engines to pieces. And it turned up again in uh, Reflections in the Water when it made a skydiver rendezvous. You know Commander Straker pretty well, don't you? Yes. Pretty well. If we save him, do you think he'll take that reprimand off my record? That was Burnell Tucker, who'd uh, appeared in uh, Ordeal. He was a shadow operative at the health farm and turned up again in Space Precinct, Death Watch. We'll have to start making for the surface. Now, we've got to phase this pretty carefully. We're working with very little air and practically no time. I'm a bit worried about the outer door on three. There's indication of severe damage. What about the pumps? Well, still no improvement. With the reactor off, the power is very low. What do we tell the crew? Aren't those nobodies? Forget it. They've figured it out for themselves already. And uh, as much as I understand Nina being put down here because Dolores Mantez is the best, probably the best actress on the show out of the regulars, I don't quite understand why Jeremy Wilkin was replaced with, with Paul Maxwell for this episode. I'm sure he could fill the role that Lieutenant Lewis does here of... Uh, Don't worry, Nina. We'll get out, all right? Keeping Nina's spirits up. But again, I do... It's not nothing against Paul Maxwell, because he's great, too. It just... Great Full crew, 69 men trapped on the bottom, but we all got out. It, it, would, it wouldn't... It doesn't necessarily make sense for Maxwell to be gone, but... Uh, anywho, he is. We've got Paul Maxwell for... Uh, was this his final... Final Anderson... role? Ooh, I think it might have been. I suppose this is a good episode for him to bow out on. All right. Let's go over the situation. We are so screwed. Have you decided on an order of escape, sir? Ooh, that's the big question. Yes, I have. Lieutenant Barry, you will use the crash dive tube. Yes, sir. Lewis? Sir? You'll have first crack at the escape hatch. Lieutenant Chin will follow you in the escape hatch. And then Colonel Foster. All right, let's get to it. 
The uh, crash dive tube is the safest way out, but it won't be easy. When we throw the control and the water comes in, it'll hit you like a sledgehammer. Yes, sir, I know. I used it once during training. Good, good. It'll only last for a second, then you'll be okay. I'll manage. Right, well, I'm really uh, glad I came down from the moon to do this for you and get stuck in a stupid tube. No chance of our surface vessel getting to the area ahead of us. Forget it. She's five hours away. We're on our own. And it's quite sweet that Freeman's taken it upon himself to supervise the rescue operation. Um, because yeah, it's his buddy Straker down there. And of course, this is uh, in production order again. This is George Sewell's final appearance on the show. This was the final episode they made at MGM Borenwood before the studio closed down. All set. Good. Synchronized watches. 1550. Check. Check. And yet, oddly enough, it does feel like a Five minutes, Lieutenant. a precursor to to those episodes. Thank you, sir. Where the the regular cast was was scaled down considerably. See you top side. And here we have an episode really centering around Straker, Foster, and Nina, all of whom would continue in the Pinewood episode. So it's it's nice that they were uh, already recognizing. What, what an asset Dolores Montez was to the show even before they had to basically that they were forced to promote her to Moonbase Commander when uh, when Gabrielle Drake was was unavailable for the Pinewood episodes here we go Nina's got the long crawl down the crash dive flood tube and uh, just as Straker was claustrophobic I believe Ed Bishop was claustrophobic in real life as was Dolores Montez which is why they stuffed her in this tube. So all of the strain and all of the fear in her face, that's genuine. Because no matter how cramped the skydiver set looks, Hello, you, mate. that tube is even more cramped. Lieutenant. Flood three. That's it. Lieutenant Lewis is off to the surface. I'm also not convinced that this airlock um, couldn't have... There's, there's, I think there's room for another person here. Could have taken Nina out this way. She's not uh, not that big. No, she's still crawling her way up this pipe. This looks horrible. This is probably the, the worst thing they ever asked any performer to do on this show is what they've got Dolores doing here, crawling up this pipe. I also find it strange that Lieutenant Lewis doesn't put the uh, the breathing tube in his into his mouth. That's flooded, sir. Like after the water is already over his head. By that point, it would seem to be uh, negative, to be useless. Um. Yeah, Lewis is having trouble getting the uh, the door open. And again, this goes back to my um, my very very grim way they could have killed Waterman off. You you get the feeling here that they are just gonna lock this guy in a a small sealed room full of water and let him drown. It's Again, it's the sort of thing UFO could do if they were feeling uh, even darker than normal, but uh, no, the uh, handle's starting to turn. And normally when you, on a show like this, when you see one of the regular characters in danger, you know they're going to get out okay. And if you see someone you've never seen before in a situation like this, you're pretty sure they're going to end up dead. But no, Lewis is, uh, he's made it. He's out. Open the door, and he's away. It's open. He's made it. Nina should be in position now. Prepare to detonate in... 20 seconds. And as discussed previously in a uh, fab fact, this uh, this watch of Strakers is the one that uh, the Andersons gave him after production wrapped on UFO, and he, he wore for the rest of his life. You can... This is probably the episode where you, you see the, the most of it. He, uh, he checks it a few times here. Nina's getting ready. Time to flood the old tube. Detonate. Unlike Lewis, she has got her breathing tube in her mouth. They should be up by now. And also like Lewis, the door didn't open on first go, but unfortunately, she doesn't have any way to force it open. And Straker and Foster just assume she's out. And this, this is... She's so scared. <laughs> Stranger! Oh, that was... Oh, that shot of her just 
crammed into the tube. No one to help her, nobody even knowing she's there. We're all of us going to get our door key, aren't we, sir? <laughs> yeah, sure. How's the head? Well, I'll be fine when I get up to the surface. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, your, uh, your, your will is up to date, isn't it? Yes, sir. What are his chances? He won't last ten minutes in the water without help. But sir, you're only like a foot away. I can't actually hear you. Oh, here comes the albatross. A nice landing on the surface of the water. Try and rest, Chin. We have in one hour. And I, I'm not sure off the top of my head at what point the cast knew they would be there would be a break in production. I would have to assume that they would know around the time that they were making this or or probably even an episode or two before. I wonder if that's why they've they've gone to so much trouble with with tilting and and at times wrecking the skydiver set like this. Straker. Ed, it's me. Alec. Thank God. We've got Lewis. He's quite safe. He's explained the situation. Now look, Ed, just hang on. Alec, have you got Nina? Nina? No. She went out right after Lewis. Well, don't worry, don't worry. We'll get her. We'll find her. Look, Ed. You've got to conserve your air supply. Now just rest and stay as quiet as possible. The divers are coming down now. They'll get you up. Alec. Alec. Power is failing. I'll check the escape pumps. They're slowing down. So it's not looking good down here at the moment. The power is failing and uh, Chin is having a very, very tough time of it. And the divers are coming down to skydive. And I'm sure that footage of uh, the two guys in scuba gear was uh, also appears in the Protectors episode Brotherhood. It's, it's flopped the other way around, but... Uh, I don't think it was shot for this episode. I imagine it would be from some some other film they borrowed that. And I love this as well. This is, you know, we've got this small cramped set. We've tilted it on one side so that it's really unfamiliar to the actors. What's something we can do here? Let's have a fight scene. Stop him, Paul. Poor old chin. I'd love to know what he's actually saying. I don't know if he's actually... How much he's in control of his actions or if he's just generally delirious. He's trying to get to the door and... That's it. Electrocuted himself and dead. It's probably a good thing nobody else pressed that button he touched. Because that was all he did. He just touched a button. And it electrocuted him. But... Uh, there we go. One less person's breathing to worry about and I love this you know death never worried me before right now I'm scared there's only two of us left and you've been here longer than me how do you mean the older you get the more precious life becomes you become aware of what life is oh ain't that the truth that's one of my favorite Straker lines that uh doesn't seem to get as much recognition as some of his others. Oh dear. So it's not looking good for anybody. Well, it's looking alright for Lewis. He got out fine. Isn't that weird? You know, the, the guy we've never seen before and we'll never see again. He's fine. Our three regular characters that we know, they're still in serious trouble. <laughs> Especially poor old Nina. It's just about time for uh, someone to use that hatch again. Commander. Get moving. But sir, Colonel Foster, get off this boat. They're breathing my oxygen. Straker gets to be the uh, the guy who stays behind. Even though, again, for those who like uh, Michael Billington all, uh, all sweaty, this is uh, another good episode for you. I also like this. When he opens the hatch and you see the water is in there from, from Lewis's escape. In you go. And because the set is at an angle, you see it splash down onto the onto the set, even though there's electrical lights and monitors all over the place. Let's just throw some water in there. We haven't put our actors through enough hell this week. 
And speaking of hell, Dolores Mantez is still with us. She's taken off all her scuba gear and is now having to crawl her way backwards down the tube because there's no room for her to turn around. There's barely any room for her to to move forward or back. So now Foster's away and as far as Straker knows, he's all on his own. Well, still got Chin there of course, but uh, Chin's not saying much anymore. She's jammed faster. The only sudden way of moving her is by heavy lifting gear, but we need the salvage vessel for that. Is there any way we can get an air supply down there? Negative. I was hoping to use the escape hatch, but it's still flooded. The bombs must have backed up completely. It's hopeless. You'll have to go down there again. And get me a suit, will you? What you gonna do? I don't know. But we're gonna get him out of there somehow. But all of you get to play in the water this week. I'm not gonna miss out. Yeah, as far as I as far as I recall, that that comes to absolutely nothing. Freeman does not contribute to uh, to the final rescue of Straker at all. And this is nice as well. Straker can hear banging and moaning from somewhere in the ship. As far as he knows, everyone's gone, so he thinks he must be going crazy. He's crazy, crazy, crazy. Except. And this is a good point to uh, to throw some old clips in there of uh, the things that matter most to Ed. Waving at his little baby son. Uh, and, um... Oh, no. Yeah, this is probably just padding to get some... You know, to fill the time with some clips, but this is so well done. This montage of clips of um, the birth of Straker's son and his death. And Straker looks down at Chino, who's, not Chino, Chin, who's just glaring up at him with his open eyes. I never want to see you again. I like the very subtle hint that, um, you, you know, the, the cutting between Chin and Mary is that Mary's tears are kind of the tears shed by all the the parents who've uh, whose children became shadow operatives and, and subsequently died like like Chin. I'm probably reading too much into it, but uh, anyway, Ed's realising that the, the banging is real. He's going to have to go and uh, check on that. This is where they left Nina. And Ed looks like hell at this point, but... Um, now we see what uh, what true hell really looks like. Nina, oh my goodness, this poor girl. And she can't even believe herself that she's made it out. It's okay. Barely speak. It's okay. okay. And this point in the episode has always seemed odd to me because, uh, as I said, I first saw this episode on BBC, and uh, I recorded it. On, on two VHS. We're sending them down now. And at some point afterwards, someone must have hit record on the tape during that moment as as Straker is helping Nina out of the tube, because suddenly there was a clip from an advert of um, a woman looking through binoculars at a guy putting lotion on himself at the beach. I have no idea what the commercial was because it was only like a split second. So that scene has never felt quite right to me without a a woman looking through binoculars. Captain. You can't say that I don't do do my bit to lower the tone here. This is a, such a serious. Uh, oh, Nina's sure. hands is covered in blood. Subject. Myself. She can barely breathe, and Straker is writing one last entry in the captain's log. Five. Claustrophobia. Negative. Last words. A note for Doctor Schroeder. And that was the last mention of Dr. Schroeder in, in the series. He's declared himself not claustrophobic. He, d he hesitated to write, just so damn brave. And I love this. If it had to be anyone, I'm glad you're here. I mean, I'm glad. It's you. 
and they hold hands. I love this little subtle bond between them here that never really gets addressed that much. And yet Nina is, as we've covered before on the randomizer, she is essentially the woman who, who ruined Straker's marriage. Because Mary had that detective follow him and, and she got those photos of him meeting up with her for for shadow recruitment business, but uh, she assumed it was a relationship. Uh, they're having an affair. And now everything's exploding. I don't like this resolution too much. <laughs> Straker laughing as the model just floats back to the surface. It's almost like, so it was all a dream. It feels like that's the ending we're building to. <laughs> I don't believe it. You mean to say you just blew us out of the water? Well, what else could oh. we do? Holden came up with the idea. Alec was basically useless. I was got in through the missile tubes. And that's the way it happened. I'm and everything was fine. I have to leave now. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. No smoking. <gasps> oh, she's going to get a reprimand on her record. Well, back to the salt. You don't tell Straker he can't smoke. Oh, That's like... Cigars, Alec. Oh, so now it's just Straker and Nina on their own in hospital. It, it, this ending, I just find it, it comes so quick. It's, it's just like this, almost like the script is written with the words, and then everything's fine pretty close down there it's not that it doesn't work it's just it doesn't quite have the time to which uh to really or didn't say to really sink in before it's just over that's what life's all about i guess the things we never say that's another great line well they're kicking me out of here this afternoon i better go and pack my toothbrush you'll be back on moon base in a week or so god knows why we're sending you back there clearly you're more use on submarines than on the moon but hey oh Oh, that's it. They're both back to, uh... They're both back in, uh, officer mode. Whatever happened between them, uh... Down in the depths, that's, uh, that's in the past. And that was Subsmash, and... Oh, I really like that one, and I know... I believe that was a favourite of, of Ed Bishop's, if not his, his actual favourite. Um, I've never heard of anyone who doesn't like that episode, and it's such a... It's such a simple idea. Just, just to take one of your regular sets throw all your actors on there just strand them and uh, and see what happens and it's it's hard to think of of anything in this episode that doesn't work really as i said before and maybe focused on too much the uh the idea of kicking off the regular skydiver crew to be replaced with a bunch of people we've never seen before and someone who probably shouldn't be there is uh, doesn't make too much sense the underwater ufo is a bit naff otherwise everything else is really good. Some amazing performances in this from Ed Bishop and Dolores Mantez. Always one of my favourites. Really love this one. That sound means yeah. it's time to talk about First Action Bureau. Sorry, Chris. Right. Lovely randomizer. Right. I'm, you know, great. Yes. You had fun. We had fun listening. But we've got to talk First Action Bureau for a minute, Richard James. Okay. Now, go on. We've gone to a huge amount of effort and expense. That sounds a bit crass, doesn't it? But it's true <laughs> yeah. to put yeah. this together for you guys to enjoy absolutely free of charge. We would really, really love it if you would give us all your support, give it a try, have a listen, make sure you're subscribed, give us a rating and just and share it around. Talk about it online, tell people about it. Look, because not everybody didn't know about First Action Bureau. Not everybody knows about Anderson. They don't have to be a fan of Jerry Anderson stuff to enjoy First Action Bureau. They just have to be a fan of science fiction and spy drama, really. Yes. And there are lots of people like that. So yes. help us out, please, right now go to First Action Bureau on your podcast app of choice. Make sure you're subscribed. Do us a rating and a review. I mean, listen to some episodes first. There should be three or four out by now that you can enjoy. Mm -hmm. And um, do what you can. Be part of our sort of Anderson army. Yeah. And uh, spread the word. Make sure everybody knows about it and uh, support this new venture because we'd love to make some more free stuff for you. But to do so... We just need to make sure those things reach as many people as possible and do as well as possible in terms of downloads. There you go. That's the end of my piece for First Action Bureau for now. Fantastic. Well, that's all very exciting. And can I just say one thing? Uh, go on. Well done, Jamie Anderson and Nicholas Briggs. Oh. No, it's true. You've <laughs> you're got you're trying to get a new job, are you? team. Yeah, yeah. I'm just hanging off the second series. <laughs> <laughs> well, funnily enough, that we did uh, talk about how excellent you were in our little chat last week, didn't we? Come, so. come. Yes, I know. But look, but seriously, you've got a great team of people, a fantastic cast, yeah. lots of people on the technical side as well, some fantastic talent there, putting it all together. Really is worth a listen. And it's, all, it's very exciting. It's good stuff. It is. And lots more story to tell. Anyway, look. 
Yes. That's enough about free stuff and podcasts, isn't it? Yeah, who needs free stuff? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, this free stuff is now coming to a close. So yeah. please do get in touch. Let us know your thoughts. Ask us any questions. Uh, send us in your collections, uh, voice recordings, uh, musical clips, whatever you like, to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Just keep it clean. Yeah. I mean, yeah. First Action Bureau, Please. borderline explicit. Jerry Anderson podcast, always clean, except for that one episode. Um, yes. <laughs> but that was a mistake. Everyone's forgotten about that. I, I shouldn't yeah. bring it up. Why am I bringing it up? No, it's oh, your dear. fault. Anyway, yes, email us, hashtag us on Twitter, hashtag Jerry Anderson podcast, where you can tweet me, I'm Jamie Anderson, or him, Richard N. James, or him over Ooh. there, Chris Dalek. Yes. <laughs> well done. It's not often I get to say that. <laughs> This excitement is all too much. I think we should probably just say goodbye before I ruin it all. Goodbye before he ruins it all. Goodbye. Stage one complete. Let's go. I wonder now, what myriad ways I can ruin it all. Sorry, go no, on, you were going to say. Well, I was going to say, now, the thing is, about writing these new short stories for Space Precinct, okay? Mm. Well, now, one of the stories is actually set in an orbiting shopping mall. Is it? That orbits Altor. Nice. And I was thinking for a moment of actually calling it Space Shopping Precinct. And what but I'm made so you glad think, I didn't. What made you think better of it? <laughs> <laughs> because to me, when we were filming the series, because it was Space Police to begin with, of course, mm. as we know, and then it changed to Space Precinct, and it always felt like, well, that's just the word for a shopping mall. It was in the UK, a precinct, you know, mm. it's like a shopping area, isn't it? It didn't yeah. sit quite right with the uh, the British cast. So I thought, well, finally, having written this story about a shopping mall in Space Precinct, it's Space Shopping Precinct. precinct. <laughs> nice. And uh, what did you actually call it? I'm not going to tell you. Oh, a secret. You'll have to read it or hear it to find out more. Exactly. Now, Richard, just very quickly on this. If mm. you had to rename the series, knowing you, you couldn't call it Space Police, but you don't want to call it Space Precinct, what right. would you call it? Pigs in Space. Oh, come on. Sorry. Space Filth? No. <laughs> Stella Rosas? No, I don't know. Stella Rossus. <laughs> ah, ah, that would definitely star the guy from EastEnders who was going to be on the podcast. Who, oh, who Ross Kemp. Ross Kemp, for yeah. a moment, a tiny moment in time, was going to be on the podcast. Until he decided not to be. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. Oh, by the way, uh, I know yes. that uh, Nick Briggs was working with Wendy Craig the other day. Oh, did he send her my love? No. Did he, if it's like? Of course yeah. he didn't. Anyway. No. She seen my Richard III. third. <laughs> Right, that's time to go now, I think, before you ruin this. let's leave it there. Goodbye. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.